Yeah, yes. So, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I, a warm welcome to everybody who's joining us live. The, this morning, Berlin time, we had a, a very good session with, on Sir Chatham House Rules. And I'll just take 30 seconds to tell you what it was about. We began by stressing that although this, organi although this meeting is solely about accountability and war crimes in one situation, Ukraine, that the people involved in organizing it are very much not selective in our approach. We strongly believe in accountability for war crimes wherever and by whomever. Our first session was on environmental war crimes, and we looked at that rather interesting discussion about how thinking has evolved in a positive direction, how people are now more aware of environmental action in general when an action is a war crime, crime and also the issue of how ecocide as a concept is going forward. And then after that, our second panel, we, we, had, a, sorry, we had a brief uh, talk by the Nobel Prize winning winner of last year, um, Sasha Matvichuk, and then we had a panel on the various uh, forms of technology and how technology and the advances in a number of fields have had really vital implications for investigations and ultimately admissible evidence. So before the next panel, which uh, Janine will chair, uh, we have two speakers. And the first one needs, is Christoph Heusgen, who needs no introduction here in Germany, uh, least of all this week. And secondly, but who was a, uh, the leading foreign policy advisor to Angela Merkel and is now the head of the Munich Security Conference. I knew him when he was Germany's ambassador to the UN and he was an extraordinarily supportive figure on almost every human rights issue. He drove the Russians and the Chinese nuts, actually. They, I'm not sure I ever told, they actually once complained to me about him, uh, the Russians did. And, um, but so he, he, he was being very consistent in his views about uh, human rights and war crimes. Christoph, would you very kindly tell us your latest thinking on the subject today? Yeah. No, thanks. Um, thanks very much for, um, for uh, inviting me here. Um, and um, I'm sorry I have to leave fairly early because I, this week I have to look after, um, after my uh, small children and um, um, thanks very much for inviting me to the Reckoning Project but also to the Burkhoff Foundation. The Burkhoff Foundation is very special and in some respect they're even better than the Munich Security Conference because um, for an event tomorrow evening they even provide babysitters to speakers so uh, we, we don't do that at the Munich Security Conference so thank you thank you for this now um, <laughs> account accountability is something I indeed um, which has been very close to my heart um, I come um, very briefly to also why that is so important um, to me and I think for for Germany um, and my first Munich Security Conference, um, you were there um, this year, um, the first panel um, that I had um, after the opening was on accountability, accountability on um, on the Russian crimes in, in Ukraine, where I had um, um, Kaya Kalas there on the um, idea of this special tribunal and um, the prosecutor general of the ICC, etc. So, and we'll have that again on the next Munich Security Conference. But why is this so important? And I just want to frame it a bit because this is key for on many issues um, that we have on the international agenda. And um, I come there you know, when I look back at um, our own country, at Germany and, and Europe. We um, went, Germany went to, when you look at the history, the history of the post war um, since 45, we have the longest period of peace in the center of Europe. Um, in 78 years, no war, that's the longest. Uh, peace period and when you compare this to the 70 years before we had three wars and three major wars we had the holocaust we had the the nazi and everything and uh, why is that uh, because in germany i think we have took the lesson that from past we have which i think one of the best constitutions we have one of the best um, constitutional courts 
And the same thing then happened in, in Europe, where, again, we, we decided we will, in Europe, we will no longer go to the battlefield, but we go to the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg to resolve our problems. And this is why it is, f for me, such a threat today that there are countries, in particularly one country, Hungary, that is actually undermining this very foundation of the European Union by questioning the authority of the European Court of Justice. And now I come um, to the broader question. The same people, or, or not identical, but the same thinkers thought that, you know, what we have now seen in Germany, what we have seen um, in Europe, is something we also wanted to install on the global scene. And this is why the United Nations were founded, that is basically enshrined in the, um, in the UN Charter, that is in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, there was also the idea behind um, the most important institution, the Security Council, um, also the International Court of Justice, um, to uh, try to have the same um, um, the same system as we have in Europe with the executive, legislative, but then also the um, judicial part. We all know the flaws um, that we have on that level. Um, and um, the flaws, of course, have to do that while in Europe, more or less, we are able to really um, then um, implement our law. There are huge fines that the European Commission can pay. We have it in Germany. On the, on the global level, we are not there yet. Um, there are some efforts. Um, there is the International Court of Justice um, that when there are cases they look at, but they have to be asked. They, um, uh, there are a few cases, um, I'm not an international lawyer, but these are special cases. The Security Council has to ask them, for instance, that we had this on the, um, the last one, I think, was the case um, where um, everybody agreed that the, in the Declaration of Independence of Kosovo would be um, assessed by the International Court of Justice, which actually said it was uh, legal, but Serbia doesn't believe it until today, but this is a different case. So we have to see to it that international law is implemented, and there we come to the subject and see, well, um, we have to do it then also on um, with international criminal law. Um, I think one of the best steps that have been taken um, uh, during the last 20 years now, or is it, no, it's 30 years, sorry. It's the International Criminal Court, the Rome Statute that we have, that cases that are brought there. The special courts um, were very important, Yugoslavia and um, 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 Sierra Leone and Rwanda. And um, we, uh, I think we have made um, some headway. We also have made some headway now with the universal, uh, uh, universal jurisdiction of national courts, um, where we also can actually then um, um, see to it that um, um, people responsible for the violation of international law um, are uh, prosecuted. I think that when two years ago we had the first case in Koblenz, this was really a, a triumph for um, accountability and for the rules-based international order. And this is why accountability is so important. The international law, the international rules-based order is so important because if we don't apply that, if we apply the international law, the international humanitarian law um, with double standards, um, we are lost. And um, then you can no longer go and claim, yes, we, we have to um, implement international law and people will, will laugh at us and say, well, double standard. And this is today even more important than it was before. I don't know if we have Americans here. This is, of course, something that is very tough for our American friends. So I wrote an article a year ago for, um, no, earlier this year for foreign affairs. We also said for our American friends, it's, you know, you have to, some have tried to get rid of the idea of American exceptionalism. You have also, if you want to cope with the challenges today, you are no longer the, the super puissance to stay really, um, um, to really keep also the moral upper hand. 
you have to also implement international law and there are so many cases where American friends didn't do it. It's very good what the Biden administration has been doing. Um, um, uh, Biden in his speech at the UN was actually uh, subscribing to this. Uh, he's getting closer to the Rome Statute and there I think he has the right instincts but I don't have to s tell you anything about um, about um, what is um, happening in the year. So um, I'm coming closer to um, where you are about accountability um, in, in Ukraine. Um, at the UN, one of the big, um, and you have discussed that, one of the big step forward um, was the triple IM mechanism um, to uh, really identify the crimes that have been committed in Syria. It was on the basis of the UN General Assembly um, resolution. The world superpower Liechtenstein was instrumental to get that. We were discussing um, before, would that be possible also for Ukraine? Um, I think it is not as likely to get in these circumstances. I had hoped on Ukraine, and I was, uh, I'm no longer in government, but I was from the outside also pushing my government to say, uh, early on, why don't you go to the special court uh, on the crime of aggression to get the Russian leadership because I think the hybrid courts um, will not do the job. And until we have the ICC actually have also the crime of aggression in the Rome statute, I will not live that. By the way, because you discussed it, I'm also absolutely of your um, view that you, I think, shared today that on ecocide, this should be the next stage where we go to the uh, enter it into the Rome um, statute. So um, I think I would like to really recommend the Reckoning Project for their tremendous work. We know it from the Triple IM and other mechanism. At the beginning, there's a lot of enthusiasm. After a while, things calm down. I remember, um, you all remember the, the murder of, of Hariri Sr. You know, there was a big enthusiasm about the magnitude trial. Who was there in the end? Um, it couldn't be carried out to the very end because there was no more, no more funding on, on this court. So it is very important that you get this support. Uh, this support. Um, you discussed before what is needed for this. Um, I don't need to repeat that, that you have those who get the facts, um, you know, get the facts right so it can be um, actually prosecuted. I have a lot of... Um, um, I have a lot of sympathy for the one who said this before. You know, for these guys between 60 and 70, they are not so computer. You need the, the you have to do it user friendly. I'm with him on this, but um, of course you need um, you need um, uh, uh, <laughs> um, of course you need computer. You you need to do this. You know, I mean, um, to to have it in a way in a digital way that you get all the facts. And one other guy said, yes, um, there may be. Um, some um, you know some corruption taking place with some digital but if you have the number of witnesses no way somebody gets away so let me finish with this say that it is very very important that we do this um, that we get the perpetrators to court if we, we owe it to the victims and it is very important for um, um, for the future because if those who are committing these horrible crimes get away know what you know they have to pay a price I always say those who do this have to have the feeling that they always have to walk with their um, back against the wall because there may be somewhere I know that Putin cannot travel to um, South Africa that while Lula has invited him to Brazil his um, court has said no way we're gonna arrest him and I think this is a very very good case of course there are individual cases we have to do it last point because you also talk about post conflict reconciliation something very important and there I can only um, advise you to look at Colombia um, I just met with the Colombian ambassador here um, and she told me that the new president is really working very hard on this this um, you know the the Nobel Prize winner Santos what he did with the different committees there they're still working and apparently with this reconciliation committee where perpetrators um, have to meet um, their victims on this in small, it seems to work. Um, is this something for other crises? I don't know, but I think it's very good that you look at it. So, with this, um, thanks for thanks for having me. Thank you so much. For <laughs> All right, um, Christoph. Thank you so much.
I hope you get to the kindergarten on time and <laughs> it'll be much pleasure. And let, we have a few more minutes. Yeah. Tim Snyder is, uh, in my view, by, by far the most renowned historian on Eastern Europe. Um, his book, Bloodlands, one of which in includes Ukraine, I read about eight years ago. I regard it as the most important history book I've ever read. And it's a huge honor to have him here. Janine, would you like to add before? Yeah. Um, we're also very fortunate to have Tim as an advisory board member on the Reckoning Project. Um, he's been very supportive to us and to Natalia Gumenyuk, who is our co-founder. Um, and we're just incredibly lucky to have you here. And for those of you who have not been watching, his Yale class, The Making of Modern Ukraine, is on YouTube. I don't know how you got the rights of, from Yale University to put it on YouTube, but it is extraordinary. And I urge all of you, if you haven't, if you're not reading his books, you must. And if you haven't watched uh, The Making of Modern Ukraine, it's 16 parts, and it's just absolutely, he's an amazing instructor. So, Tim? Thank you. Well, it's, um, it's actually, it's a great honor and a great pleasure for me to be with all of you. I wish I could be with you there in, in Berlin, but I'm very happy to be involved in, in, the, in the Reckoning Project. What I like to do with my little bit of time is, um, is is make a kind of double argument which has to do with history on the one side i think that um ukraine is to, to borrow um peter pomerantsev's phrase it is the kind of el dorado of accountability um not just in the present but in the past there has been atrocity after atrocity which has not only been prosecuted but ignored but on the other side it's it's my sense and my conviction that if we can get accountability right for Ukraine now, that will help us to that will help us to understand the past of Ukraine as well. In other words, there's a there's a kind of mutually fulfilling logic here where if we understand the history of forgetfulness about Ukraine, that will provide us with some of the context for understanding and prosecuting now. While at the same time, if we do manage to understand and prosecute now, we'll understand Ukraine better. So let me just let me just flesh this out in a in a few minutes. For me as a historian, it's really extraordinary how easily we overlook Ukraine. Um, Ukraine is a piece of the puzzle of European and of world history, which we simply don't have. And without that piece, um, the whole the whole picture very often doesn't make sense. The languages that we're speaking at this conference, you know, whether it's English or German um, or a number of other languages, Indo-European languages. It looks very much like Indo-European or Proto-Indo-European came from Ukraine. The ancient Greek civilization, which a number of people regard as being important to our political or scientific or intellectual or moral traditions, that ancient Athens was at a synthesis with the kingdom of the Bosporus, um, a kingdom in what is now south, southern and southeastern Ukraine. That is completely forgotten, but it's essential to the whole story. Kievan Rus was an entirely typical medieval kingdom, typical in its relationship to Byz Byzantium, typical in being founded by Vikings. It's it, Without it, medieval Europe makes no sense, and yet we all teach med medieval Europe entirely without it. The Cossack Rebellion of the 17th century, early proto-national anti-colonial movement, generally completely ignored in discussions both of anti-colonialism and of, and of early national movements. And then as we come into this 20th century and events that are more familiar to, to all of you, I'm sure the, the pattern repeats itself over and over again. Um, the Holodomor, the, the mass famine of Ukrainians, the political famine of Ukrainians, which was planned by Stalin and executed by Soviet authorities in 1932 and 1933, was almost completely overlooked. The Soviet Union followed a very successful strategy of identifying people who spoke about the, the famine in Ukraine with the Nazi movement in Germany and thereby intimidated people or calumnied people such that it was very difficult to make a case that something was actually happening, even though what was actually happening was until the Holocaust, the greatest policy of mass killing in Europe in the 20th century. As many of you will know, um, there was a one Guardian reporter uh, who wrote without a byline. And there was one reporter who wrote in English under a byline, a single one, about the famine in Ukraine in 1932 and 1933. His name was, was Gareth Jones. And so an event of that magnitude almost went completely without being noticed. 
And although we think we are clear on the Second World War, and the Second World War is a basis for, um, of course, a great deal of this discussion and for the notion of accountability for war crimes, Ukraine actually generally goes unnoticed or essential elements of the war in Ukraine go unnoticed. We, we think we, we take the Holocaust seriously, of course, but we don't generally notice something essential about the Holocaust, which is that several of um, the precipitating events of the Holocaust, the mass murder at Kamyanets Podilsky, um, of course, the mass murder at the edge of Kiev at Babi Yar, uh, that, that these were the beginning of the Holocaust. These were the, the first time in human history when more than 10,000 people were shot um, without that specific understanding of the Holocaust by bullets, which of course has grown in the last couple of decades. One can't account for the Holocaust as a whole. And of course, that had a great deal to do with how the Holocaust was minimized and overlooked in post-war Germany. Because if the Holocaust is regarded as being a matter of quote unquote camps, and those camps are then run by a relatively small number of people, then we don't have to think about the tens of thousands of Germans who took part directly in shooting campaigns in the East. So forgetting about Ukraine means forgetting about how the Holocaust began. It means forgetting about half of the victims of the Holocaust, but it also means forgetting about the vast majority of the perpetrators of the Holocaust, which is in fact exactly what happened and still happens. So in a broader sense, Ukraine was central to the commencement of the Second World War. Hitler's main objective in the Second World War was to control the agricultural potential of Ukraine. The Ukrainian breadbasket, or corn comma, was absolutely proverbial. When Jürgen Strop, who of course put down the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, was in prison in Poland after the war, when he was asked by a Polish prisoner what he was doing when he was putting down the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, he said, I was fighting for the land of milk and honey, which is Ukraine. This was essential to what Hitler and to what everyone else was thinking about the purpose of the war. Ukraine was the notorious Lebensraum of German war planning. And yet, if Germans are asked today what the, World War, the Second World War was about, roughly 1% will mention Ukraine. So there's a very profound sense in which even the things that we think we remember are forgotten when they, when they touch on Ukraine. And similar things can be said about, about the post-war period as well. Um, it's, it's certainly true that when we think about the gulag, although it's, it's not something which we've forgotten, of course, very few people will recognize or remember that Ukrainians were hugely overrepresented in the gulag, um, especially in the period after the Second World War. When we think about the late Soviet Union, um, and we think about dissidents um, and, uh, and political prisoners in the 1970s. We're very over. We're very apt to overlook the Ukrainians and the very specific arguments they made about human rights. No one forgets about Chernobyl in 1986, of course. But Chernobyl um, is a is a very good example of how something which is a specifically Ukrainian event uh, can have political resonance and and largely get lost. Likewise, the end of the Soviet Union, this is no longer an atrocity, but this is just a, something that we overlook. And this has been on my mind um, with respect to the Budapest Memorandum. When, when the Soviet Union came to an end, it was not Russia, but Ukraine, which was the country which was essential for making this happen. It was without Ukraine, there couldn't be a Soviet Union. And yet the vast majority of us in the West, I think it's fair to say, concentrated on, on, on Russia and thought about Ukraine as a, as a problem rather than as a solution or rather than as a key element of what had to happen going forward. And then this in turn is essential to how we reacted to the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014 which was, of course, also a violation, although almost no one talked about it at the time, is a violation um, of, of aggression, right? That's how, that was a war, that was a completely un, unprovoked war of aggression. It was on a smaller scale than 2022, but it was nevertheless an unambiguous violation of international law. And yet we found ways not to see Ukraine. We found ways not to understand it as a war. We found ways to understand it in some cultural or civilizational or, or other propaganda sense. Um, and so this leads me to, to the present war, which of course has been so horrible and which has been greeted by so many talented Ukrainians with so many different forms of, of exposés and discussions and revelations that it provides us with a chance to reverse all of this.
it gives us this chance to turn Ukraine um, from something that has been sadly a kind of black hole for memory and accountability into an opportunity to advance memory and accountability, not just in Ukraine and uh, but around the world. So this is my this is my gentle thesis on on the one side. Um, the difficulties one has in, a, in accountability with Ukraine are are historical. They're rooted in some habits of mind which go well beyond Ukraine, well beyond Russia, and and deep and deep into the international sphere as well. But on the other hand, should we be able to um, enforce accountability on the basis of, of of fact and law this time around? I think that will help us to better understand the Ukrainian past, and that's something that we'll get from this. I have been brief. I have stayed within my time limits. I'm very pleased with myself about that, and I, I hope this has been interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, also, both of you for being, being very concise. So much appreciated. It's time for the next panel now. And I, okay. I'm gonna... Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter Pomerantsev, Ibrahim al Rabi, and Dr. Beth Van Schack, who's online. And Sevgil. Sevgil, can you hear us? We can't hear her yet. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. My... Okay. I'm here. We've got four minutes. Should we start early? Okay. Do we have Dr. Van Schack online? I came up wrong. We've got Darth Vader online, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's try... For some reason, my video is not working. <laughs> no, neither is the audio. But... Try again. Oh, is that working? Are the tech guys back there? Are they doing anything or are they just? Yeah, no, but I think it's there. Ambassador, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Hear you, but not very well. Um, is that your end? No. Okay, I think it's your end. Are, we could see you. Should we try to give it a go? Okay. Okay. Um, everyone, welcome. This is uh, the, panel, uh, the panel on accountability. And really what we want to look at here are lessons learned. The Reckoning Project was founded very quickly, a few days after the invasion, by myself, Peter Pomerantsev, and Natalia Gumenyuk. When we started, we rushed very quickly into a, a brutal um, occupation and war of aggression, and we hit the ground running. What have we learned in those 21 months since then? What can we do better? What has happened since the beginning of the war with civil society working very closely with governments and also with lawyers? with the legal system, with the ICC, with the various tribunals. How can we do it better? So I'm going to start with Ambassador Beth Van Schack, who's in California or D.C.? California, I think. Um, I'm in D.C. No. <laughs> who is the U.S. Global Ambassador on War Crimes. She's also a renowned professor of law at Stanford University, writes prolifically for uh, someone who is as busy as she is, writes an extraordinary amount, and is also deeply respected by all of us and a friend to the Reckoning Project. So I'm going to kick off with, with Dr. Van Schack. Um, what I'd really like to talk to you about, earlier today we had Anton Kornjevich, um, the Ukrainian ambassador for the crime of aggression, talking about where we are with that now. And I know that the U.S. had supported the idea of the special tribunal on the crime of aggression, and you, your role is partially responsible for defining the, the U.S. position. I, I'd like you to talk about where we are now with that, 
how you feel about other courts, what other options we have for getting the pathway of justice opened. And more importantly, is it unlikely Putin will be prosecuted whilst he is a sitting head of state? How can it work with immunity? People often bring up the example of Charles Taylor or Slobodan Milosevic, but they're not really equivalent because, of course, Charles Taylor was not a, at the time a, sit, a sitting head of state, and Milosevic was an entirely different matter that I won't go into here. You've worked both on the Yugoslav tribunals, Cambodia, and have vast experience with international law. Tell us the U.S. position right now, Ambassador, where we are with it, where you think we're going, and your views on Putin ever getting into the dock. Sure. Thank you so much. Some audio issues. I hope this is better. No. It's not. Is there nothing we could do? What? Oh, maybe turn the camera off. That's a, Would that work? Um, okay, let's try it now. Is that any better? I'm now, I've turned the camera off. Um, Okay, how about going out, like disconnecting and coming back in? Not that I'm a tech okay. wizard by any means, but, but let's, Beth, try that. See if you can go offline and then come back in, okay? And I'll entertain the audience while, while you're doing that with my card tricks. <laughs> right. Let us know when you're back on. And tech, German tech here, is there any, nothing you could do from that end to make it a bit more clear? Okay, well, in the worst case, if not, I'm calling Fred back up on the stage, to, or Natalia, Natalia. Okay. Just let us know when you're back on. Oh, okay. All right, so then let's go to Ibrahim. Ibrahim Alabi is the chief legal counsel for the Reckoning Project. I would really like you to frame your comments within the work of the Reckoning Project and what we are doing, but could you talk to us about universal jurisdiction? Because this is something, you know, one of our team members, Raji Adel Salam, worked on the Koblenz trial we are working on something, I don't know if I can say it yet, um, but is this the future of war crimes tribunals? Is this the way that justice is going to move? And explain a bit to the audience who might not know how universal jurisdiction works and how we specifically at the Reckoning Project are working towards it. Sure, thank you, Janine. And you can see the trust that, that Janine talked about in the previous panel between lawyers and journalists and how it actually worked out in practice. She asked whether we can talk about a case that we're working on, to which my answer was no. But, that, but, but, that, but that's exactly the, the, what the Reckoning Project is about, is that the, the idea of bringing journalists and lawyers together to be able to really elicit and, 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 and get as much as we can um, uh, 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 in terms of the, 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 the uh, you know, the, the impact of accountability that we want to get out of it. Um, in brief, I'm, I'm originally from Syria and I've, I've been working on Syria and, and I still do. And so universal jurisdiction there was almost the only avenue that, that we had in terms of any sort of criminal, uh, uh, criminal justice. So the way the universal jurisdiction features into the work of um, uh, uh, the, the Reckoning Project is partly informed by our kind of I don't know if positive or negative, or you can put any words to, but our experience from the Syrian from the Syrian context. Um, so the way the way we see it is that universal jurisdiction is definitely a tool, and it's an important tool. It's something that that is um, with some countries available, and that we are able to kind of access. Um, but in my opinion, it has been mistakenly seen as the only tool as if that, that is where we need to go uh, when we want international criminal justice. Um, and in our opinion and how we see it in the Reckoning Project, it is um, 
mistakenly seen as such, um, because domestic jurisdiction has, should in our opinion be seen as the mitigation for when we don't have, when it comes to these international crimes, and this was the German position that we, when, you know, at, um, at the UN, that Germany is doing what it, what it can because there is no international tribunal to be able to look into these things. So, in a way, universal jurisdiction is really a way of showing leadership of countries saying, we will domesticate these things, we will investigate them, we will look um, uh, at what we can do. But we have to make sure it is seen within a wider ecosystem of international trials, both criminal trials, other international trials, and to be able not to be seen on their own and shed light on them strategically. After Koblenz, how many of you, by a, razor, by a show of hands, have seen or heard of German cases on Syria? Other than those that I, I know in the audience have worked on them. Exactly my point. There has been investigations, there has been trials in Frankfurt and other places on universal jurisdiction on Syria with Syrian perpetrators. Zero of you in an accountability panel have heard of them. And that's not about you. It's more about the Syrians and the international actors who are working on them who have not been able or used universal jurisdiction just as a process without shedding strategic light on it. Because people remember the first case, people remember the important case, but that's not justice, that's not accountability, that, that's more shedding light on you know, one of the uh, uh, kind of elements uh, of it. So if universal jurisdiction should be used, and I, and I would advocate for it, but I advocate for it in, in, a, in, a, in a specific way that I'll come to in a moment, it needs to be done strategically. So how do we do that? In my opinion, it should be on cases that cannot be tried internationally, or can, we cannot focus on them internationally in order to supplement the international justice mechanisms that exist. It should shed light and should focus on cases where we cannot bring other countries easily on board. So universal jurisdiction cases, I mean, the, 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 the ambassador was here, I don't know if, if he's still here, but, but the, 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 amba the, the German ambassador to the UN was, was here and he talked about Koblenz. And Germany was very proud, rightly so, of Koblenz at the UN. And was going around and saying, we did Koblenz, we did this, we did, we did that. And in front of the world stage, one of the, well, actually not one, multiple responses led by the Russians at the time, not that we're taking them credible, but it was a response that came on the record, was, but you're one country. You're politicizing justice. You're selectively using cases, which is not the case at all. And so wherever we can add the word international to prosecutions, at least for a historic memory perspective, that would be better. Failing that, Either where we cannot get international responses, either because of capacity or selectivity or inability, um, we should look at universal jurisdiction or, or the ability to kind of use universal jurisdiction uh, uh, in, 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 on those. And the other reason is because I've worked with the police. I mean, as Syrians, we spend our time running away from the police most of the time in, in Syria. But when we, well, in, the, in the UK and other countries, the police and the war crimes unit from my experience in dealing with them, one, they're under-resourced and overstretched quite significantly. But secondly, the success metrics for them is very different than the foreign office elements. So for a police department that usually is under the home office or, 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 or the equivalent as such, opening an investigation that does not lead to an actual arrest and charge can be seen in the internal system as a failure. You've opened an investigation that you could not close. And that success metric is not right in cases of like Ukraine, because just an investigation or an arrest warrant is incredibly positive for the reasons that we heard in setting the narrative and making it hard for perpetrators and so on. So either we have to encourage the police departments to open cases and resource them that they know they cannot necessarily close, or we should use them in a way that kind of supplements what, what is out there. So in, in short, universal jurisdiction is an incredibly powerful tool that shows leadership that should be utilized, but again, it should be utilized strategically, and that's what the Reckoning Project will try to do, to shed light on the investigations, to shed light on the outcome, to shed light on the witnesses, the stories, what, what, what is happening with it, and the incentive structure of success 
should not necessarily be if I can arrest or convict, because as we know in a lot of these cases we can't, and therefore the police should not be discouraged from looking into these things when they cannot, because, of the, because the impact, the positive impact from simply opening an investigation can be enormous. And that's what the policymakers across government really need to realize to make the benefit out of universal jurisdiction. Thank you, Ibrahim. I'm going to come back to you later with a question about redefining genocide. Um, Ambassador Van Schaak, are you there? I am. Is this any better? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> Yay. Okay, great to see you. Uh, do you want me to repeat the question or you're okay? And no. You, could, you can no, roll with it. I have it. it. Okay, great. I can roll with it. Thank <laughs> right. you. Good. Welcome back. Yeah, so y thank you. Uh, and Ibrahim, thank you for the brilliant uh, exposition on universal jurisdiction. Um, that was really very enlightening. Thank you. Um, you know, when in my work, I often talk about the five pathways to justice for Ukraine, and universal jurisdiction is one of those. Um, cases in Ukrainian courts is another, and we're doing as much as we can under the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group to support that effort with our colleagues within Ukraine, investigators and prosecutors who are right now, as we speak, investigating more than 100,000 potential atrocities to be tried uh, in Ukrainian courts, some measure of those. Um, international institutions is another pathway, and we know that the ICC has made its first move. And then the final pathway that I discuss before I get to aggression is always what can we do here in the United States to strengthen the legal authorities we have. And we have done that with respect to building out our War Crimes Act, that it now has something closer to universal jurisdiction. We still require the presence of an accused in the United States before charges can be levied against that individual. But before that amendment, we had required either the victim or the perpetrator to be a U.S. person. So that severely limited the utility of our War Crimes Act in the Russia-Ukraine context and in many, many other contexts, such that it had become essentially a dead letter. But the pathway that you've asked me about, Janine, with, is with respect to the crime of aggression. And where I want to start is where the international community, working very hard through a core group of states that Ukraine has convened, is in concurrence. Um, we, we agree on much more than we disagree on. I think all of these states agree on the imperative of prosecuting the crime of aggression as the sort of progenitor crime that gave rise to all the other war crimes, crimes against humanity, and atrocities we're seeing. It was that fateful decision to invade a sovereign neighbor and to seek territorial acquisition and political subjugation that then has given rise to all of the circumstances we've seen in terms of war crimes and crimes against humanity. And there's a very interesting question about how one prosecutes the crime of aggression as a kind of continuing or iterative crime, and there's been some new thinking on that. Um, in the blogosphere. So everyone agrees on that. Everyone agrees that most the most senior levels of the sort of the Kremlin, both on the political and the military side, should be held accountable for the decision to invade, the planning, the implementation, the execution, and the continued um, acts of aggression that have followed from that decision back in February of last year to launch the full-scale invasion. And let's not forget going back to 2014, as we heard from Professor Snyder. This is a, a longer, there's a longer time frame here than I think many of us who had focused on Ukraine in the last two years um, really appreciate necessarily. So that's where everyone agrees. We agree that there should be international involvement in the prosecution of the crime of aggression. This should not be a task that is left to Ukraine itself, that this was a breach of global norms, norms that peace-loving states hold dear, and that the international community should assist in this endeavor, just as they did after World War II um, with respect to the Nazi trials and the trials of the Japanese imperialists. So that's where we agree. Where we have a disagreement is with respect to what entity would stand up or create this new institution, whatever it would happen to be. The Ukrainians have in the past favored the General Assembly playing this role, but we have seen increasingly at the General Assembly a dim diminution of political support for resolutions that require the General Assembly to go beyond a recommendation role. So. Re Resolutions that condemn Russia's actions, that call for accountability, they garner very high levels of support amongst other states in the range of 140 or so states, very solid majorities. 
But the minute the General Assembly is asked to, for example, kick Russia off the Human Rights Council or create a register of damage for Ukrainians to record financial harms associated with Russia's war of aggression, then the support drops to closer to 90 states. So it's a much slimmer majority. And there's real concerns that asking the General Assembly, especially under now today's political environment with a new armed conflict raging now in the Middle East, to ask them to create a new standalone institution is potentially a bridge too far. And even if the resolution were to pass, it might pass with such a slim margin that it wouldn't send the political message that Ukraine wants to be sent, that this is an international exercise in jurisdiction. So the United States, in the alternative, has favored what we've described as an internationalized tribunal. This would involve essentially some kind of a specialized chamber within the Ukrainian national system, but benefiting from significant international investment. And that investment can take multiple forms. It can take the form of funding. It can take the form of the secondment of personnel to work side by side inside the, the judicial or the prosecutorial system. It can the, take the form of information sharing diplomatic support. This tribunal could actually be established extraterritorially because security conditions may not allow it to be stood up in Kyiv or in the, in the country itself, but then it could be moved back when and if security conditions allow. Now, the Ukrainians are concerned about this on two levels. They're concerned that it doesn't send the message or carry the gravitas of a General Assembly resolution. And my hope is to be able to build a consortium of states that would support this effort to be able to give the uh, imprimatur of the international community were this to go forward. The second concern is one of domestic law and the need to potentially amend the domestic constitution if, for example, international judges were to sit side by side with their Ukrainian counterparts. And I understand the, the difficulty of doing that, particularly in a conflict situation. No state should take lightly um, amending its constitution, its core constitutive documents. So we're looking for ways, creative ways to work around that need to still internationalize this effort without requiring Ukraine to necessarily amend its domestic legal framework. A final issue, which is in many respects driving the choice of modality, is the question of head of state immunity. And, and you mentioned it, Jeanine, in your opening remarks. So the question is, could an internationalized tribunal overcome Putin's head of state immunity if he were to be prosecuted while he's still occupied that position. And I think the prevailing response is that no, that this would still be considered essentially a domestic tribunal because the basis of jurisdiction would be Ukraine's territorial jurisdiction. And so pursuant to customary international law, a domestic court could not overcome head of state immunity if he were still in that position. That said, there's a lot that that entity could do. The, the domestic authorities can investigate, can prepare indictments, can investigate and prosecute individuals below the so-called troika, the top three head of state, head of government, and foreign minister. Um, and then everything could be teed up and ready for the moment at which um, President Putin no longer carries that title. It is true that many believe that an international tribunal that would be stood up by the international community through the General Assembly or otherwise might be able to overcome that. And there is some precedent in the Chucky Taylor case, in the Charles Taylor case, where Charles Taylor was indicted while he was still a head of state. But as you mentioned, he was ultimately prosecuted only after he was no longer head of state. And at that point, the state of Liberia had essentially consented to the special court for Sierra Leone prosecuting him. And all of the other heads of state and heads of government that have been prosecuted almost to a T, there's one or two sort of odd exceptions, um, were either no longer heads of state or there was the consent of the state of nationality of the accused. So we don't have a situation in which an international tribunal has prosecuted a head of state. Of course, the ICC in Article 27 does not recognize head of state immunity, and so that issue will be litigated if and when one of the two now individuals who occupy the position of head of state are subject to charges, either President Putin himself or ex-President Omar al-Bashir, who was prosecuted for acts that he stands accused of committing when he was an active head of state. And so the, the court has ruled in principle, it has jurisdiction over Omar al-Bashir, but Omar al-Bashir has not been able to contest that in, a, in an adversarial process. So 
to get to your last question, which I think is where we have ultimately landed, the possibility of President Putin standing trial while he is still a head of state, I think is vanishingly small. And so we should not allow this tail to be wagging the dog of what the modality of this new tribunal is. And we should move forward with what is immediately available and could be stood up now, rather than hoping for an elusive international tribunal that may not have the votes at this point. Now, two points to make before I close. Number one, we're not sitting idly by while these while the international lawyers are debating this within the, the context of this core group that Ukraine has convened. There is now standing up in The Hague, the International Center for the Prosecution of Aggression. And a number of states have relocated their national prosecutors to The Hague in order to contribute to this sort of proto prosecutorial office. We have a seasoned prosecutor from the Department of Justice that is playing that role now. So that really, I think, expresses the degree and level of support that the international community has placed on the imperative of prosecuting the crime of aggression. And then the second final point before I close is the Europeans have been exploring very creatively other ways to imagine how to bridge the gap between an internationalized tribunal and a full-scale international tribunal that is the model that Ukraine favors. And this would involve a number of states that have aggression within their domestic codes coming together to stand up a tribunal. And then Ukraine could transfer proceedings into that new institution. This is a, a model that is still subject to a lot of discussion. We're waiting for concept notes to flush out some of the core questions. But suffice it to say that the international community is still working hard to come up with a model that works and that can start thinking about um, prosecuting these cases as they appear either from the Ukrainian national system or as part of the work of the International Center for the Prosecution of Aggression. So with that, I'll, I'll see the floor. Thanks so much for including me in this conversation. Thanks, Dr. Van Schek. Do you have to jump off now, or um, are you, because there's one more thing I do want to ask you, but I can come back to it um, at the, after I go to Sev Gill and Peter. Um, I can stay on, but I would have to jump off afterwards. So why don't you ask me now, if you don't mind. Okay. I don't mean no, to absolutely. monopolize the conversation. But. Your role as global ambassador for war crimes, you're traveling far and wide. You're with the Rohingya. You're writing about the Uyghurs. Um, you have an extraordinary dossier. Um, exhausting, but hugely important. I just wanted to ask you, in the time that you've been working on Ukraine, what you see do you see a hastening of the international justice system? Because we know with Bosnia, it took so long. Um, Rwanda, there are still perpetrators roaming around London. And the question that I'm always asked as executive director of the Reckoning Project is, but when are we going to get these guys? And with lawyers like yourself and Ibrahim, justice is a long process. So I just want to come back to you either now or before you hop off. Just where are we in terms of Ukraine and how do you feel realistically it will be before we actually see, you know, pragmatic on the ground tribunals or bringing people, you know, to the docket? Yeah, it's a terrific question. And I, I have both an optimistic and a pessimistic answer. So I'll start with the optimistic answer. I too was a part of the standing up of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. It was my first job out of law school at the end of the 1990s. And you know, it was a very long process. By comparison, in this context, the international community has mobilized with a, a, a degree of alacrity that we really have not seen um, in other situations. Everything from standing up a joint investigative team among some of the regional states who are now prosecutors talking to prosecutors, sharing information, the standing up of the, of the atrocity crimes advisory group with the US, the EU, and the, the United Kingdom now has, has been opened up to additional states. We've created a multinational fund in order to ensure the longevity of that effort. The ICC itself moved very quickly. The prosecutors sought arrest warrants against President Putin himself and Maria Lavova-Volova. We have all of the civil society work, including the Reckoning Project and your really unique wedding of international criminal law expertise and journalistic acumen to be able to create reporting that can be used in accountability processes. But all the other local grassroots civil society and um, um, actors, including the creation of digital vaults to be able to secure and lock down digital artifacts of war crimes so that they can be used in criminal processes. 
All of this, I think, is a really tremendously good news story. And I think it's a situation in which this rising tide is going to raise a whole number of boats, including in other situations and contexts. We're developing our expertise, we're building relationships, we're building confidence in our ability to use universal jurisdiction, and there's a lot of creativity around institutional design. So that's all the good news. The bad news, or the, the pessimistic side of things, is very little can be done without custody of the accused. Now, investigations can happen, proto-indictments can be drafted, and everything can be poised at the ready. But most systems cannot move forward without the custody of the accused. Ukraine can under their national system, and they are doing some in absentia trials, but they don't carry the same weight, of course, as a fully adversarial proceeding. The ICC cannot operate without the custody of the accused. And many of the European states that are supporting the idea of a prosecution of the crime of aggression disfavor any sort of an internationalized model that would rely upon um, in absentia trials. And we've seen a, a grand experiment in this in the special tribunal for Lebanon, which after millions and millions of dollars having been spent, resulted in just a, a judgment on paper against a handful of in absentia defendants. And so it is unlikely that the international community will want to repeat that, that experiment. And so what is holding up more visible process progress here is the lack of custody. Now, we know that after conflict situations, perpetrators are on the move. This has been the case in every other conflict that we have seen. And now we have prosecutors that are increasingly ready to move forward quickly because they've done <clears throat> structural investigations, they've prepared dossiers, they have fulsome files on individuals, they're in touch with each other so they can track the movement of individuals. Why do these individuals travel? Well, sometimes they become persona non grata in their system, or there's a political transformation, and they're concerned about the alternative if they stay within their national system, or they want to go shopping, or they have a kid in school somewhere. For any number of reasons, perpetrators will travel. And so the next phase of this giant accountability exercise is going to be tracking the movements of these individuals and being ready to move quickly, sharing information, issuing indictments, and gaining custody over those individuals so that they don't enjoy the, um, the privilege of, of anonymity or of impunity. Now, as long as those perpetrators remain in Russia, absent of political transformation, they will enjoy impunity. And that's where other transitional justice exercises of truth telling, et cetera, are going to be incredibly important so that survivors, victims, and others have an opportunity to tell their story, to preserve that for history, for memorialization purposes, et cetera, even if we can't invoke retributive justice against those individuals. But some of them will travel. They will travel eventually. This conflict will not go on forever. And the world's prosecutors are ready to move if and when that happens. Thank you so much for that. Really, really informative. And thank you for hanging in there with us with <laughs> the computer problems. Yes, no. <laughs> thank you, um, Ambassador Vanshek. Um, Sevgil, I think I'm going to go to you next um, and then to Peter because you're in Kyiv. And um, yeah. to the audience, Sevgil Musvai is the editor in chief of Ukrainian Pravda, a very courageous reporter. And Pravda Ukraine has been writing about war crimes for years. Um, could you just give us a from the ground view of what is happening now in Ukraine? What are the crimes that you are the most concerned about and that your reporters, you and your reporters are documenting the most? Thank you so much, uh, Janine. Thank you, the audience. Uh, can you hear me? Is it okay? Okay, I can start. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thank you for your support of Ukraine. I know that uh, you incredible partners and uh, when people usually ask me what is this war about uh, and um, I answer that there are some of aspects of this war of course this is war for independence of Ukraine because Ukraine is fighting for the right to exist of course this is war between two systems uh, democratic and authoritarian but for me as a journalist uh, it's uh, first of all the war between truth and lies and the war to the right to call a spade a spade and for the last um, uh, 20 months of this war, um, together with my colleagues, we heard uh, different stories of uh, war crimes that Russia committed in Ukraine and uh, from uh, 
uh, residents of cities and towns in different uh, regions of country and uh, the equally horrific um, outskirts in Kiev or small city of Trostinetsnia uh, near Russian border or Kharkiv region. Uh, so what we saw this year is amputated body parts, broken limbs, um, electric torture, sexual exploitation of women for food, uh, raped men, children, elderly uh, people, execution of refusing to cooperate, uh, shooting on peaceful location, convoys, hanging, interrogation with hammer, so everything. And uh, all that residents um, of liberated cities or those who managed to escape uh, told uh, me or my colleagues. And uh, we actually learned the truth about these crimes um, thanks to journalists, thanks to work, for example, Reckoning Project as well, because uh, journalists of this project worked uh, on the ground. And uh, also we were the first uh, journalists, uh, among the first journalists who had an access to Butcher, for example, and even in Butcher, um, why it's uh, also important to cover these war crimes, for example, we had also our personal stories with Butcher because the father of our colleague, uh, Valeria Kizilov, he was shooted by Russians uh, in the beginning of uh, March 2022. And we also were, uh, were able to uh, publish an investigation about his death, about uh, soldiers who committed this crime, about uh, actually all obstacles and all all um, all, all details about this uh, this crime. Um, what also I want to say is that um, mm, this is interesting because, um, you know, like when I was growing up in um, Ukrainian Crimea and um, dreaming about becoming a journalist, I also read a book about uh, Anna Politkovska, who was reported about uh, Chechnya. And then when the war started in Ukraine, I compared what Russians committed in Chechnya with what Russians committed in Bucha or other um, cities of Kyiv region, and actually it's the same. So this is a part of, I think that uh, Peter will um, tell you more about uh, Russian warfare and propaganda as a main uh, um, the main uh, thing of this uh, Russian warfare, but I will tell you that uh, war crimes is also part of uh, Russian warfare. And why it's so important, why they also commit this war crimes, I think that it's about um, fear. It's about how they, um, this is a part of Russian strategy, uh, just to destroy this um, resistance and uh, also suppress uh, the protests in occupied territories. Because, uh, you know, I'm Crimean, uh, I also knew how it worked in Crimea, how uh, Russia also committed the war crimes, how they started uh, to uh, clean everything. I mean, all people who can just protest against that and uh, how the first victim of uh, Russian aggression actually it was Rashad Nametov, uh, Crimean Tatar who went to uh, his, his protest against uh, um, uh, Russian aggression. So that is why um, the question of accountability is so important. And I think the one of the goal why Ukrainian journalists um, continue to um, find all these op find these evidences about war crimes why they still publish a lot of investigation about the war crimes is about accountability and i think this is a main goal of a reckoning project as well uh, another goal, uh, of course, of Ukrainian journalists and Ukrainska Pravda journalists, uh, we all knew that even our national system has more than 70,000 cases now, uh, and it's impossible just to write the stories about all of them. Uh, but people are not numbers, and uh, first of all, it's um, about uh, providing and about providing a memory for these people, providing the stories of these people. But also, I want to uh, tell a little bit about um, uh, lessons learned for this um, uh, 20 months of war. Um, of course, uh, there are a lot of lessons that a journalist uh, learned. First of all, just to continue to uh, do this work, even I, I do understand as a, for example, as a journalist, that topic is not so much popular now, for example, for Ukrainian audience, unfortunately, because people are tired about uh, of that. But we continue to uh, cover the most uh, important uh, topics and the most important Russia uh, crimes that Russia committed in the last one, for example, the village of Brazai, it was uh, around um, three weeks ago when um, uh, Russian missile killed um, 
um, more than 60 people in a small village uh, where just 300 people uh, live. So this is um, uh, important to focus on such stories. But um, two important topics I think that we will have we have to focus in the future. Uh, first of all, the deportation of kids. Unfortunately, um, it's very difficult to find information about that. It's very difficult to uh, find uh, evidences. Unfortunately, we are not so much successful in that topic. First of all, because first of all, we, we don't have an access to this territory. We don't have an access to Russian territory. Where all these people, all these kids were deported. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, we will um, we published an investigation about uh, um, deportation of kids and actually all camps uh, they were deported, all cities they were deported. Uh, we found all people involved in this process from Russian side, um, but uh, it's hard to find uh, an access uh, to these places. It's hard to find um, uh, people who are able to find uh, these places in occupied territories. Unfortunately, that's why here we can we have to think about cooperation. Collaboration, collaboration with um, um, foreign reporters, with uh, international reporters, with uh, um, um, also people uh, from civil society as well. Another topic, uh, unfortunately, this topic is not popular among Ukrainian journalists, among Ukrainian media. Uh, captured civilians. Um, all human rights defenders in Ukraine will tell you that there are more than 50,000 uh, civilians that were captured by Russians uh, from the beginning of full-scale invasion. And unfortunately, um, you know that all these people could be tortured, and, uh, but uh, there are no so much uh, attention to this topic, and unfortunately from official um, side as well. So our authorities, they more focus now on the protection of kids, they more focus on uh, now of um, captured soldiers, capture Ukrainian soldiers, militaries, but unfortunately the question of uh, civilians who were captured by Russians from the beginning of war is not popular and uh, absolutely underestimated. Uh, so, um, for us, it's important to bring justice, to bring accountability uh, for Russia in this topic, uh, and uh, this is the main goal of all Ukrainian journalists, I think, that not only uh, uh, find these cases, not only tell the stories about these cases, uh, but also to continue this work uh, with uh, providing more evidences. Um, um, and uh, to these important topics that need more attention from international journalists, from uh, the human rights defenders, uh, deportation of kids, uh, with providing more evidences from occupied territories, and the second one, uh, civilians who were captured by Russians, uh, underestimated topic that we have to focus to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sevgil. Mm -hmm. Peter Pomerantsev. I we part of a, a project, the Reckoning Project, is now working on is propaganda and how it could be used, or can we actually use it as a war crime? Can you just talk us through this historically, what happened at Nuremberg, um, what we're seeing now in Ukraine, and how we can kind of thread this together? And, and can you, because Peter is an expert on Russian disinformation, what's coming out of the Kremlin now? What is their propaganda machine? How are they working? And then I'm going to come back to you about indoctrination, which is a separate thing. Thank you, Janine, and, and thank you, um, my co-panelists. Um, so just to be clear, like Sev Gill, I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. My background is in, in, uh, in, in journalism and media and storytelling. But I guess this is where these things really meet, which is what is the potential legal accountability of propagandists? Um, so. I'm sure my, my legal colleagues can add so much more than I can, but, but as I try to understand this topic, I realize, I mean, how, how complicated it is. This is the collision of, of two great principles, the principle of freedom of speech, and um, at what point does, do, 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 does speech become liable? Um, it's very complicated. I, I think, actually, you mentioned Nuremberg. We've talked about Nuremberg a few times today. I mean, it's very emblematic. At Nuremberg, there are two... Nazi propagandists on trial. Julius Streicher, the editor of Der Stürmer, is found guilty. Um, 
he was actually, I think, found guilty of, of, of incitement and sort of creating, you know, creating the environment where the Holocaust was possible. But he was also a senior Nazi official, you know, he was a Gauleiter of Nuremberg. So I think it was quite easy to show that he was part of the planning as well. Hans Fritscher, who was the main editor of the Reichsradio, the sort of 7 p.m. Uh, newscaster on the Reichsradio, um, was found innocent because basically they couldn't prove that he knew about the atrocities being committed, that he was part of the planning. And, and he was just like, Goebbels gave me some stuff to say. I said it. What do I know? It's just words. And words make nothing happen. So, so I think there you have the tension already. Um, I mean, there's been several attempts to uh, prosecute uh, propagandists uh, in, various, uh, in, in, in various tribunals, most famously in Rwanda, but as many times as they were convicted, they were found innocent. Um, and coming to Russia Today, um, both Russia Today, the TV company, and Russia Today, um, I think it's worth starting with Syria, because I was involved in the analysis of Russian propaganda around Syria, and, and here's where it gets interesting, because now we're in a digital age. I think it's possible to use a lot of the digital analytical tools to really get much closer to showing the integration of military activity and propaganda activity. If before it was a, a bloke on the radio somewhere far away, Auschwitz happens, here we can really see how closely these things are integrated. And that started with Syria, with, with tremendous work largely about the disinformation campaigns the Russians were orchestrating around atrocities committed in Syria and around the White Helmets specifically. These orchestrated campaigns to smear emergency workers in Syria, um, l largely sort of uh, people, Syrians who pulled victims out of the rubble, but who filmed these, 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 uh, these events to sort of smear them in, in, in various ways. And we could clearly track how that was orchestrated, how that was tied to specific um, attacks uh, on, on infrastructure and on civilians. So that, I think we're in a new media era, and that means we don't just have to think about Nuremberg. We don't just have to think about Rwanda. We have a new media landscape, which I think calls for a moment where we can re-examine the delineation between horrendous speech, and I'm very much of the party that says you should be allowed to say whatever you want within existing laws, and something else, which is the planned, coordinated integration of propaganda in order to, often to aid and abet crimes. You know, we're not even saying they're the main cause a lot of the time. We are seeing how they prepare the ground in the lead up to an attack on civilians, how they try to whitewash the attack afterwards. But they're completely integral to the planning. I mean, maybe think of it as the getaway driver in a crime. You know, they drive the perpetrators to the event and then drive them away again. So we're not always talking about kind of incitement to genocide, which is the big one everybody obsesses about for good reason. There's many other things we can start unpicking. And technology is a game changer. Media is a technology. So I do think we're in a new era. We're only at the start of this journey, which makes me almost as cautious as Ibrahim in, in the way I'm phrasing things. Um, one thing I've learned from the lawyers. But um, clearly, a new media era, which is integrated into military doctrine. By the way, the Russians integrate information operations into the heart of their military doctrine. They give military awards to their journalists. They clearly see them as part of the military machine. That calls for a new, a new era in, in understanding the criminal liability of, of propagandists. Hi, um, who are you watching the most closely in Russia now? Who are the journalists and what are they saying? And, and also, what about that example of Bucha? Mm. Wasn't there things just before Bucha happened that, I mean, and I know you and I always have this discussion about Mil Colin in Rwanda. Um, I was in Rwanda in 94, unfortunately, and you, you always say, no, Rwanda is not a good, Mil Colin, which was the radio station, of course, that incited the Hutus to slaughter the Tutsis, um, saying over and over they are cockroaches, you know, kill the cockroaches. What happened with Bucha, and who do you look at in Russia? When you're studying this, can you give us a specific 
one or two examples of people and what they say? So, okay, Butcher, we have a correlation. This is exactly the sort of thing we're going to explore. And the correlation has been published by... Um, can we talk about in, yeah, no, no, it's been, not by us. It's, it's a correlation that's been published by multiple researchers, including by the Global Engagement Center of the U.S. State Department, which basically shows that look, there was a switch in propaganda speech from the most famous Russian propagandists. So these are the official state propagandists, um, Kisilov, Solovyov, Simonyan, who everybody focuses on, um, the Hans Fritsches of, of today, the people who, who go on media and, and make these horrific statements. And... Look, there's a very noticeable switch. People can fact check me on the month, but I think sort of into March 2022, when they go from saying, oh, we're just here to get rid of the Nazis who have seized control in Ukraine, so the Ukrainian government, to, as the invasion goes badly, saying, oh, Ukrainians have all been you know, brainwashed. They're all Nazis now. So it kind of switches from the target being the Ukrainian government to the Ukrainian people. And there seems to have been, again, we are just talking about correlations at the moment, that is when a lot of the more egregious atrocities that target civilians seem to increase. Again, I'm, using, I'm really starting to talk like a lawyer. Um, but, but there appears to be a correlation. Again, finding out whether there was causation, what is the relationship between those things, is a huge project. Um, also, look, one of the things that I find fascinating as, as a scholar of propaganda, reading over the cases in Nuremberg and other places, is how law, which sometimes claims to a, univers a universality of, uh, of, of interpretation, is actually deeply embedded in, in very, very fluid and changing ideas about causation. So back in the 50s, we had a very different idea about how media influences people to how we think about it now. So what do we even mean by causation? I mean, I know law loves to be above the world. When you get into the details of something like, you know, the effects of media, you are so in my territory. So there is much to think about, about what does the word causation even mean? How does media actually influence people? So very, very dense territory, but there is this correlation that has been pointed out. Everybody's looking at the loudmouths, yeah? Everybody's looking at the, the Simonians, the Salavziovs. I'll be honest, I'm least interested in them. They are purposefully, aggressively using types of blatantly, and now I'm going to be a journalist, blatantly genocidal speech um, with calls to liquidate the Ukrainian nation. But they're doing that in the full knowledge they're not going anywhere. You know, in the Russian system at the moment, like in many dictatorial systems, if you want to win the trust of the leader, if you want to rise in this system, you need to splatter yourself in blood, like in a mafia organization. Yeah? So they're doing this almost on purpose. They're pouring blood on themselves to say, trust me, dear leader, and elevate me in this system. They're not going anywhere. I'm not interested in them. I want to bring down the whole system. I'm not interested in two or three voices. They're replaceable. I want to bring down the whole system. To bring down the whole system, we go after the funders. We go over the advertising that still exists on many of these TV channels. Yeah? We go over the people who rebroadcast them. We go after the technology companies that further distribute. So I'm interested in the system. I'm interested in undermining the system. And if we you know, get a couple of loud mouths in absentia, who want us to get them, by the way, you know, it's embarrassing if you're in the Russian elite and the Hague hasn't got you, because Putin's been got. You want to be, on, you know, you want to be there. It's kind of embarrassing. So they're the ones who least interest me. I think about this systemically, and it's a huge challenge. But um, that's what we're here for. I'm going to come back to you. How are we doing for time? We have until four or four thirty. Four thirty. Okay. Ibrahim, Peter just mentioned the G word, genocide, um, <laughs> which we're all. Very cautious of, um, Ambassador Van Schack has, has said in interviews and, and written about how high the bar is legally if we go after the charge of genocide. Srebrenica, 1995, it, it's still disputed the language of was it a massacre or was it a genocide? I was there, I say genocide. Ukrainians have been pushing for genocide, um, the genocide char charge, and yet we know it is a very high bar, and also 
as Natalia and all of the researchers would say, we have so many crimes that are, I'm not going to say equally important because they're all horrendous, but we have so much torture. We have so much arbitrary detention. We have so much forced disappearance. So can, do you feel like we're right now with the whole Ukrainian accountability issue that we're redefining genocide? Because now we also have cultural genocide. And the Reckoning Project is involved, sponsored by the German government. Thank you very much. Um, the children, you know, the stolen Ukrainian children who have been taken from their homes, or in some cases their parents did sign forms to let them go to summer camps. And they are in Russia being russified. And that is called a cultural genocide. So is the destruction of monuments. Where are we on this legally? And how, and also the elephant in the room, there is another war going on in the Middle East right now, which that term is also being tossed around, rightly or wrongly. But where, where are we in terms of Ukraine, accountability? This is a panel about lessons learned and where we are down the road, 20, 21 months, 20, 20 months on. Um, how do we redefine genocide? Thank you, Janine. Um, I guess my, my first question is why, like is not the word that I'm looking for, but why do we, why do people feel, why do victims feel, why do governments feel like genocide, they would like what happened to them to, to be described as genocide. And I think this, is, this should be the starting point. I'm not a social scientist, um, and that's not, that's not my expertise. So if I look at it from a very penal perspective, you get the same sentence. I mean, what's the sentence for a war crime versus a crime against humanity versus genocide? It's, it's the same. I don't think there is a criminological, hopefully we don't get there, that there is a criminological situation where you can torture someone as a side of penal because now you've done a worse, a worse crime. It's either, the, 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 uh, either it's a life sentence or in some countries a death penalty, and, and, that's, and, and that's as far as you can get. So the penal is the same. The difficulty in prosecution is 100 times harder. If I can get someone on a war crime, that's exact same someone on a war crime, or I can charge them as genocide. If I'm interested in a quicker trial, probably go for the war crime. So why is there an interest in, in, in that word? And I think that really helps us, un, you know, uh, the, the answer to that helps us understand where, what justice and accountability means for people. Because if it was just court processes, if it was just criminal accountability like we know it, it wouldn't matter what the... People get done for taxes and, and, they, and they go to, to prison or drugs and they're warlords. We've seen that over and over again. And so clearly the, the use of the word genocide represents something social, something psychological, something cultural that is of, if not more, of equal importance to the people and the stakeholders that we are here talking about in, 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 in that sense. So we must remember that, I mean, I have uncles that are older, I'm not sure they're going to appreciate that, but they're older than the foundation of international criminal law. International criminal law started with Nuremberg. They're, my uncles are willing to change some things. And so criminal law develops, international criminal law develops. We, we get stuck with this idea of it, it's defined as such by our predecessors, so we have no right to address them. That's absolutely not true. That law develops for a reason. And with actions and with consequences and with events, the law is supposed to develop. So is genocide as defined today easily arguable in the Ukrainian side? There are people who argue for it and people who argue against it. And that's why lawyers have jobs, by the way, because we're paid to argue. Otherwise, I mean, don't expect anything to be kind of completely uh, 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 agreed on, honestly. And, and, and so it's not like the technological thing where you input data and you say genocide, no genocide, right? Like even, even when the ICTY was established, the Yugoslavian court, the first defense was the Security Council does not have the right to establish a, a court and people pushed back on things. So no one is going, to, no one should expect that um, uh, terms like this or whatever crime or whatever perpetrator is going just to give in for what, whatever uh, uh, definition we choose or whatever legal instrument we decide to apply or whatever method of court we decide to, to, to establish. It will always be a fight. It will always be uh, 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 an, an argument. And so the question is, is this fight and this argument worth having? And at the Reckoning Project, our answer is absolutely yes. 
And absolutely yes, because it shapes a narrative. People remember those who were charged with genocide more than those who were charged with war crimes. That, that, I don't know what this, I married a psychologist, I'll ask, I'll ask her that, I have no idea why. But that G word that you're using, is, it really kind of sticks there. There are studies of genocide, there's books around genocide. It's more for a historical narrative that seems as important as char, you know, trying to find ways to deal with the laws. Now, <clears throat> sorry, the, the problem we have in amending laws is that if the laws are not created for a specific purpose, there are other considerations to take them into account. So when genocide was defined in the Rome Statute, it wasn't just the Ukrainian context that one would think about. There are so many different issues. So this is where policymakers have to, have to think about. Am I supposed to create crimes and, and elements of crimes that fit every potential and current purpose that, that I have, and therefore they might be tightened, like the issue of genocide, or watered down, like, uh, like, like other issues? Or am I ready um, to create things that are tailor-made? The reason we have specific crimes for Yugoslavia is because there was a Yugoslavian charter that was drafted for the situation that were defined as per the issues were happening. The same thing with Rwanda, the, the, the same thing with Nuremberg. These specific charters defined the crimes as they were in that context. Now, if we're going towards universality of institutions, not universality of norms or crimes, which has its importance, then we need to be worried that that might not fit every purpose for that thing. So the question is then, is it worth the effort? And as I said, it is, it is yes. But should those who are dealing and pushing with that effort of definitions and, and, and dealing with, the, with these issues go in blind, blindly and not be aware of the legal limitations of what they're saying? Absolutely not. And I love that you know, Peter is using more disclaimers than a lawyer on, on, on this panel. And he's saying, I'm being the journalist here and saying, genocide because he fully recognizes that the law has the limits and I think that's what we in order for us to have effective change we need to understand the, the, the specific limits um, that the law as it stands today that doesn't mean we cannot change it or improve it or amend it uh, or God forbid get rid of it that allows us to kind of push forward uh, 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 on that you can see and I'll just finish the genocidal point on, on, on that the Armenian situation, the Armenian genocide. Why after so long, with no court, criminal court, or immediate criminal court, are the Armenians fighting so hard in getting that enshrined? Why, is, uh, why are other countries pushing back against that definition? Because it has implications on narrative and, and history for the people who kind of are uh, uh, affected uh, uh, by that. If I can, just in one minute, yeah, no. Uh, I want to deal with, 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 with a very quick point that um, Ambassador Van Schaak uh, mentioned about this issue of custody, very briefly. I don't know of how many war criminals hand themselves in. Right? So let's put aside that the idea that this is how you get custody, let's just put it aside that I'm sorry, I did a mistake, you know, I'm handing myself in. And I'm also not sure how many criminals get kind of, you know, in custody commandos, Tom Cruise style, where people come down and just hitch them up and, and, you know, send them to court. So how do we actually get these people? I mean, I live in London. Harrods and shopping is a way that you can, you know, people travel in and, and, and you can get them, fine. But let's assume you don't check your name for ICC arrest warrants before you're booking your BA flight to Heathrow. Let's assume you're smart enough to actually check whether you're wanted or not. How do you actually get custody? If you're looking at the majority of cases, is that these accountability efforts have, done, have, become, have added so much political pressure on the entities harboring them that some sort of either internal transition or external transition gets them handed in. They get extradited, coups happen, people arrest them, and so on. And so the question is, while we know there might be immunities on, 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 on kind of certain individuals, is it not worth putting that pressure, adding that weight, in order for these people to become such a heavy burden, a reason for lack of development, a reason for lack of funding, like Omar al-Bashir was, for people to be, to be able to, to, to act. And while that is happening, while we might not have immediate custody, accountability at the Reckoning Project, the way we see it, is not just defined by, as I said, by, by the ability to have a, a court processes. A lot of, and include, including, you know, I've spoken to diplomats who know Russian diplomats very closely, and they love this idea of being a state and their diplomats being active and, and going around. So when you're confronting them there and taking away that international legitimacy, that is a form of accountability that you're able to do, and that's why we engage with you in special procedures and, and we put the kind of diplomatic machinery of the Russian, because you're moving from a state 
to a regime. In Syria, when people used to get arrested at the checkpoint and slapped by officers, they used to say, We are the state, not the government, not the regime. We are the state. And so when you're taking that away through different processes, that might hurt certain diplomats, honestly, far more than if there is an arrest warrant against them. Because all of a sudden, no one's speaking to them. Remember when we were at the OSCE, we had a diplomat saying that the Russian diplomat raised his hand and said, no one spoke to me about this. This is a Russian diplomat saying no one else spoke to them after they were consulted and, and part of kind of every process uh, uh, on this. So we must be, you know, we, we must remember that while issues of immunities are important, they're, they're not necessarily a barrier. And we must import, remember that, you know, it's not necessarily a bar to investigation. It might not be even a bar to arrest warrants. It might be a bar to trial, fine. But the value of actually going that far today for, for the issues of narrative and for the issues of justice and making it so hard is absolutely worth it. And that's what we push for at the Reckoning Project. Thank you. I'm going to go to the audience to questions, but first I'd like to go to David Simon, who is a member of the Reckoning Project board, but also more importantly in his role at Yale University, the director of the Yale Genocide Center, and from Yale Jackson. Um, can someone bring him a microphone? Because I just would like him... There you go. He's right there. Um, David, the, genocide is such a murky definition, and we were just standing talking about another war in another country and um, vaguely discussing it. Talk to us about Ukraine and the, the issues surrounding whether we are going to call it genocide or cultural genocide and what you see as happening. Sure, thanks. Is this on? Time? Okay, great. Um, yeah, it's it's and thanks for for uh, calling on me. And and by the way, everyone on the panel has been spot on about this. I n nothing to disagree with at all there. Um, so I hope everyone was paying attention there. The uh, the, the st I guess I have three main thoughts on genocide in Ukraine. Uh, I'll say each briefly. Uh, first is is uh, clause two e of the Genocide Convention, forcible uh, transfer of children. That's as plain language as you will find anywhere in the 19 articles of the Genocide Convention. It, it's, it's what, six or seven words, forcible transfer of children, uh, qualified with, with intent uh, to destroy a national group in part. Uh, the russification element, to me it's not cultural genocide on top of, of um, defined genocide. It is defined genocide. The russification is the intent to destroy the culture in the context of um, forcible transfer of children. Secondly, uh, on cultural genocide uh, more broadly, it's not a existing recognized crime unto itself. Uh, it was something that had been considered back uh, in the 40s, but, uh, but was not added to the convention. I, I, and, and yet, it, we, we have signs of a lot of acts that seem to be destruction of, of schools, libraries, uh, places of worship, uh, and, and, and not just in Ukraine. It's frequent in interna uh, instances of international crimes, international conflict. Uh, I see that as a uh, perhaps something that indicates, as with, uh, with the, the, the Clause 2E, the forcible transfer issue, I see that as a p potential sign of intent. If you are destroying culture, it's because you want to destroy the group as a group, uh, and, and that that is sort of it qualifies the other crimes, the killing, the the infliction of harm, uh, et cetera, that are defined in the Genocide Convention. And then the third point, I just wanted to highlight something that Peter said that that pivot from uh, we're going to go after the elite because they are uh, you know, the, the leadership of the Ukrainian uh, state because we see them as Nazis, as was the original line of Russian propaganda, to, all you, to the Ukrainian ident identity is a Nazi identity, and therefore we're, we're, they, we're going to go after all of them, or everyone is fair game. That is, for me, the key pivot in, in the... The sort of the notion that at least elements of the conflict, uh, particularly in the West, and I'm, I'm just not familiar about how that's played out in the in the East, uh, that that is uh, th those are elements of genocide there because yeah, anything's going to be in part. The the, the convention says uh, intent to destroy in whole or in part a national group, et cetera, et such, and. Uh, 
but but the elite could, is a thin definition of a part, uh, in part. But all Ukrainians, anyone who identifies as Ukrainian, national identity, is subject to be destroyed because of their, uh, because of that their embrace of that identity, that's when it becomes, um, w when you reach, I think, a sort of, uh, it's not explicitly a threshold, but essentially a threshold in, uh, in, the, uh, in the genocide convention. So, so. Thank you, David. Um, any questions from the audience? Any comments? Anyone intervention? Yes, Samuel. Uh, thank you very much. So, um, my question is the, uh, the following. I think in terms of accountability in Ukraine today, one of the critical points is to look at how the interface between civil society organizations and the prosecutor's office in Ukraine is actually working and how this interface has developed over the past 21 months somehow. Um, and my question to you is, uh, to you, the Reckoning Project, or others who have worked on this, is how this connection has evolved we have heard this morning with the different databases that there is a potential for access for the prosecutors into some of that information. So how is this going to work? Because I think this is going to be a critical point uh, in terms of yeah. uh, reaching thank, accountability. Thank you. I think I'm going to let Natalia Gumenyuk um, take that. She is our co-founder at The Reckoning Project. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. And it's very interesting interaction um, uh, and also a new experience to us. I probably should make this disclaimer that coming from Ukraine, you know, the prosecutor office by the independent journalist is not exactly the usual venue to cooperate. We had really, really bad prosecutors at different times. So we really took it with some level of uh, being cautious. But uh, since uh, for, for a quite a long period of time already this year, we really found this particular organization to be the one of the most open organization in the country to work with uh, uh, witnesses and be open to them. So in our way, and it's nothing uh, really secretive, we you know, really understand that they are overworked. So uh, we created more or less the way how, because the, our methodology in fact allows the prosecutors to access the data in in the most convenient way they can because they cannot watch hours and hours of video they cannot read all the transcript for them it's a bit of the problem to really accept this data because it's too much so we really created the basic database in ukrainian that they can access and say do they need that or do they not? So we are so far able to uh, give the, uh, the data to the people, to the prosecutors, and it's going also to the regional level. Uh, of course, it's harder to follow up what's going on with the, the cases. But there is something also to say that uh, around a month ago, we presented the, the book of the Reckoning Project, which uh, is in Ukrainian so far and has, you know, the major 10 stories on the first year of the of the war of uh, of the first year of the war. And for this day, we initiated the open public discussion between the general prosecutor Andrei Kostin and the uh, protagonist of this book and around 20 of our witnesses were brought from different places uh, of Ukraine to Kiev and other members of the Ukrainian prosecutor's office were, mm, you know, for, for a day debriefing them on what's going on with every single case. Uh, they really said that it's not really that systematic. They really need to prepare what's happening in particular individual story. Uh, but yes, it worked because some of the people were approached before before this visit or even after, but I figure out that even the idea of meeting these people together was really incredible and therapeutical for survivors and the people to whom I talked a day before they came to Kiev, um, who after a year and a half were a bit lost in what's going on with their stories, with their cases, uh, that by the evening and by the day they spent, they at least have some hope that something is going on. Sometimes for them it was important just to explain 
what is a problem? What is the difference to try in the case of collaboration, collaborators? Why the SBUs, the security forces, is dealing with collaborators, but the general prosecutor's office with the Russians? You know, a, a lot of a lot of que questions arose, and uh, I found this really like a very initiative, a very very positive um, way of any way of interaction between the survivors and the the uh, prosecutors also for the prosecutors it was important to meet the people and to see them uh, they really can't meet all but the for prosecutors in Kiev just to understand where the issues, where are the gaps. So I do think this interaction, interaction should be facilitated for, uh, for further, and that should be the way, but also not speaking on behalf of the general prosecutor office. But there are some initiatives which I actually liked and which really helps us to understand the change of the mindset. What they say is that the whole Ukrainian prosecutor system has really this post-Soviet -Soviet tradition where the only task they need to do is to deal with perpetrators and to f find the perpetrators. They never really cared about the witnesses. Never at all. The system was not in place. And now it's like turning up inside down. They don't have perpetrators, but they have hundreds, thousands of witnesses. So they really need to transform the whole system in which they need to find the way that they put a time to talking to witnesses and at least doing something with them, which is just really like absolute shift from, for the prosecutors. And there are some interesting initiatives which arose. So for instance, we had the formality when there was one way for Ukrainian prosecutor office to interrogate anybody who comes to place. It's just the procedure, interrogation. And it sounds not right for the witnesses, for survivors. So they just now introducing the idea of the witness interview instead of in interrogation. For me, these type of things are extremely important if you really are a bit more into the system to understand how difficult it is, how really, you know, how much of the change is needed, but also the fact that it's happening. And uh, I so therefore I'm also would be the ones who would say, I know how it's difficult for them. I want the prosecutors to do more, but you know, to see this whole complexity, uh, that's also could be very, very helpful. And I think it's also could be born from this type of the interaction as we had, because they wouldn't understand it without dealing with us or other civil society groups. As well, we won't understand that if we won't be on the constant, uh, you know, talk with them to understand that it's not really just the lack of political will, but there are uh, like these underlying issues. I'm not even speaking about the lack of the resources in regions where most of the crimes are really happening. Yeah, so ju just to, to, to add a few things up upon that, I mean, uh, honestly, the, the the current, um, uh, uh, you know, prosecutor general. Uh, our experience with them is that they've been very open, very encouraging, uh, uh, very much available um, to me to discuss. Um, and th there are a couple of, t of takeaways that, that that I personally, as I said, I, I mean, I still spend uh, some time working on Syria and, and the majority of my time on, on on Ukraine. So I have a stark comparison between what the difference is when you have a state on your side and when you have a state that's you're after or they're after you depending depending <laughs> depending on the day um in, in a way so so in a way ha because we live in a state-centric system even in international criminal law having a prosecutor part of the state that that is with you in a, in, a, in a way is incredibly helpful it's incredibly helpful for storing information it's incredibly helpful for extradition requests it's incredibly helpful for mutual legal assistance for being part of joint investigative mechanism the um a task force the list goes on and on and on um and w what I've seen is that the Office of the Prosecutor General has been very, very open when they feel that there is an added value of engaging with, with, uh, w with civil society. And I mean, we're lucky, I can, I can only speak for ourselves, that they've been engaging with us quite extensively, um, asking for the witnesses, being able to interview them, and, and, um, uh, uh, and so on. And we also consult, consult them when we are thinking about our own cases, where we need to go, because as you know, some universal jurisdiction cases, the, one of the criteria has to be that the case is not investigated elsewhere, which when you have hundreds, uh, you know, 100,000 cases being investigated, going through the list and saying, can you please, can, I, can you look whether this one isn't in order for me to be able to bring it somewhere else, is also part of the, 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 the challenge. In, in a way, that's something that we did not have an issue with in Syria because none of the cases are investigated, so you can immediately go to universal jurisdiction or international courts here. You have to make sure 
sure that the, that the prosecutor general is not looking into it, which is a challenge, but quite important in, when, when it comes to collaboration. And because this is a frank, open uh, 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 panel, I'd also say you know, a, a message to kind of civil society and to, to many civil society colleagues is that we need to humble ourselves a little bit when dealing with the prosecutors around the world. Because I've seen NGOs and colleagues that I hold very dear that come with ready dossiers and say, open an investigation now. You know, I have the full case, I've been working on it, and so on. No half-decent prosecutor is going to do that. I'd be worried for prosecutors who take cases from me without questioning them. I'd rather they question, and then I can prove the point, rather than them accepting on face value the evidence that, I, that, I've, that I've put together. Because part of the legal process is due process. Why don't we convict people in six-minute trials? Because it's not about the conviction, it's not the word trial, it's not the word court. It's the fair trial, it's the due process, and the prosecutor needs to be able to do their job. And that might mean that civil society might hold off on doing something that they think is useful when it's not. So consulting law enforcement when designing the project, and I feel there are a few donors in the room, and I'd hope they insert that, their criteria before they fund, in, in terms of consulting the stakeholders, understanding how to make use of that evidence, collaboration and working with, with others, being able to say, What's useful for the prosecutor is not actually an in-depth interview that I do. It's a screening interview that then I can do a preliminary um, uh, analysis of it. Or is it an in-depth interview? It might be either. It might be some, one time an in-depth interview on an issue, but a screening interview on, on the other. And that's the kind of humbling that we need among civil society in order to be able to really do what, what is most beneficial if we think engaging with the prosecutor is not beneficial, and in the case of Ukraine, I think it is, given the, 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 the examples that we've had, um, uh, that we've had with them. Um, so, so definitely um, very important to have that collaboration and, and very important to reduce the work, not increase the work. We're very good at suggesting ideas. We're very good at suggesting projects. Oh, here is a new crime that is neither in your code nor international system that I want you to look at. Probably the answer would be no. And so, but if I come with something research, something decent, something that they can add, that they see the added value to, something that isn't within their strategy, something that might inform them, the answer would be probably. And that, I think that is our role in working with uh, uh, law enforcement and the prosecutor of Ukraine, who, as, as I said, is very open in engaging with civil society. Thank you, Samuel. Anyone else from the audience who'd like to pose a question? Raji. Thank you, Ibrahim, for this amazing talk. And uh, it's actually a food of thought and a um, small thing because I had a lot of beautiful ideas, but there's something that is nagging on my head. Uh, and I'm taking the chance because we have an amazing scholars and pr practitioners about genocide. I need in my work something that I can measure. If I don't have something I can measure, I can't create an argument to send it to my legal team. So when I go back to the genocide, there is an element of time. And this element of time has to show some kind of a damage that is irrecoverable. But in our discussions uh, in Gaza or in, uh, in uh, Ukraine, it's always about a certain one element or two elements or certain act that we are trying to measure to see, is this act of deportation of kids damage the population as a whole or as a part or damage a certain element within them that it's irrecoverable. But what happened if we have more than one element working together, none of them alone is damaging the population as a whole, as, as a part. Like, if you look at Chernobyl, if we look at Kahovka, okay, there are war crimes, we can argue about that. But what happened to the population that lives in that area and now the life is so difficult and hard for them to stay in that area? What is the effect on them? What if the effect of a continuous bombardment and when it makes the life of the population is so difficult that their, the population is now decreasing? And this is how the, there is element of time. So to me, as a practitioner, I need something to measure. So this is my question. What should I measure in such a situation? Thank you. Who wants to take that? No, that's what I ask him. <laughs> what do we measure, Raji? <laughs> like, what do you want us to measure? Well, what, what are the innovations we'll be doing around the children, for example? A lot of great organizations are, are working on the, on the subject of the children, but we're going to look 
uh, ways to, to look at the impact on society more broadly. And I think it's very important, uh, exactly, especially in something like genocide, what is the overall impact on, on, on the fabric of, of a society, which, which means we have to start using other tools beyond just here's the crime, here's the perpetrator. How do we start doing that larger analysis? Yeah, and Andrew Gilmore, do you want to add anything about transitional justice in terms of this? And Is that the next creative? panel? I, okay. Um, Ibrahim, you want to take that? So, two, two quick points on the idea of, of measuring. F first, um, even in a domestic car theft, loss of a job case, in my British barrister hat, we struggle to measure. Like, loss of income, how do you measure that? Loss of opportunity, how do you measure that? Like, I mean, there are guidance and so on. So I think we need to be very careful, and that, that's what I meant by the success metrics between domestic and international systems, where the, the idea of success is very different. So while we need to measure something, that something needs to be defined in that context so that we are able to say, in this context, this is how we're measuring because of, because of these issues. But that is never a kind of a very easy, straightforward case. It, it, it never is. The second point, regardless of how you measure and regardless of what the crime is, as I said, people will always, if the perpetrator makes it to the trial, I can guarantee you they will have one of the world's best lawyers defending their case, because they can afford them. And these lawyers will tear the arguments apart. And so there are always ways to argue. So the question is, are we looking for an argument to do it, or are we looking for an argument not to do it? You'll find both. There is, I find it incredibly odd that in this day of transitional justice international criminal law, we're asking for the suspect list, we're asking for evidence beyond reasonable doubt, before, in order to think about, we're raising technical issues of immunities, in order to think about whether it's worth it to establish a court process. In all other situations, these three things came after, I mean, I'm dealing with, with, with a separate issue, and they're like, do you have a suspect list? I'm like, that's for the court. That, 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 that's not necessarily for us to be able to, to look into. So. The, the idea that I need to have a waterproof case that suffers from no technical issues that is fully measurable before beginning a, pro a, 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 a process of accountability, if I can be as cynical as that to say, that's what perpetrators would want. Because they would overburden the system, they will push propaganda, they will put their lawyers to publish blogs about how that's not necessarily legally arguable in order for us to, que to question the efficiency of, a pro uh, of that process in the first bit. Dare I say, part of our children's work, or the, our work on, on the deportation of children, I've tasked my legal team with a horrific job. I've asked them to be Putin's lawyers. And I said, take this case apart. How would you defend it? After getting through the initial reaction, which took some time, they did. And there are arguments which I will not present now in case he's listening, which I doubt. But the idea is, is that every case has a counter-argument, and so we need to know them in order to build the cases, but they should not stop us from going to trial or creating processes that allow us to moot these cases in order to be able to at least have the process, even if it's dismissed on a technicality, or the interpretation is not exactly how it is, it might be, it might be just part of that healing process, day in court, uh, and benefit that we might get from the entire reckoning for the crimes that they've committed. Thank you. I've got a question from someone online, but I don't, and then I'll come to you, Alina. I don't know who's posing this question. It's just a kind of turned up on the iPad. Lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. What is the hope for international criminal justice procedures to overcome the unimpeachable impunity gap, which are at their core? politicized. I'm not sure how to take that. Peter? What is the hope for international criminal justice procedures to overcome the unimpeachable impunity gap which are at their core politicized? You're asking me this as a writer or as a, not a lawyer? Okay, two minutes <laughs> as a writer, two minutes as a lawyer, and then to Alina before I, we close. I mean, like, this is, this is, this is, um, a real sort of head twister I know, of a... Exactly. I mean, uh, every word on accountability in yeah. there, but I don't quite know what it means. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
So I think, I think th th this is a really good chance for me to just talk about what I wanted to talk about. Um, I, so, um, but, but which relates to this, and I, I just, I'm just not clever enough to answer this question. But um, I, I think going back to the core of, of what the Reckoning Project is about, which is this idea of putting media and law together, and, and even more than that, putting culture and law together, because we don't just do journalism. We're working on documentary plays. I've just got a film treatment through from Ukraine's, one of Ukraine's best feature film directors, which has been inspired by some of our work. Um, we're already talking to some of the greatest nonfiction writers in the world about how they can explore our archive. But um, talking about something like genocide, I mean, you know, for me, it's obvious why genocide is so important. It's one of these rare moments when the law gave culture a way to talk about ultimate evil and define ultimate evil. Um, and these things are so deeply embedded with each other. And, uh, you know, there's many ways that we work together in the sense that, you know, we do stories to keep an agenda going, to make it easier for the prosecutors to build cases. That's a very linear relationship. But there's a much deeper relationship. Obviously, the cases we should do first are the ones that are inside criminal codes. Uh, of course, the ones we're thinking about most of the reckoning are the simple cases, torture, critical infrastructure, bombardment of civilian objects. But the way we can feed into thinking about these potential new areas, about cultural genocide, whatever that means, uh, the, pro the, 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 the responsibility of propagandists, I mean, that's something that has to be done in culture. That's something we have to talk about as a culture, understand, digest, before it gets anywhere near, I think, sort of lawyers taking it forward. Um, and I think just in our conversation today, we've had a hint of how these things all, all play together, which I think why reckoning is, is something new and, and necessary. And it's really summarized in Janine, who is a writer, a literary nonfiction writer. She's a great writer but also somebody who is, is completely embedded within the very kind of like, you know, stringent logic of international humanitarian law. Um, so I hope I answered that question. You did a great job, Ibrahim. <laughs> so there are two words that bother me in that question. Not bother me, that are worth, I think worth dwelling into. Hope and unimpeachable. And I think these are the two things that again, perpetrators want us to feel. Lack of hope and the fact that impunity is unimpeachable. And I think the two things that we need to be very careful of is giving in to, do, to those two things. And it's easier said than done because when atrocities are being committed and we know exactly how they're being committed, when they're being committed, so well documented, and we're unable to act in the speed that these crimes, much quicker, we're acting much quicker now, but still not at the speed that the human level would be able to say that this is some sort of accountability, we might lose hope. And if we lose hope, we give up, and, and, and perpetrators will definitely have an unimpeachable impunity then. Because people would have given up and saying, what is the point? And that is why part of the Reckoning Project is to be able to keep the stories and appeal to people and these might be small success stories. Small, but success. Something that at least the wheels are spinning in a specific way. Coming from someone who's, who's working on Syria, because we didn't have something like the Reckoning Project that sheds lights on the process and the small successes, people are like, what's the point? Why, why, why should I engage on this? Why should I give my evidence? Why should I get re-traumatized? Why waste my money? Why fund this? and so on. And I think that's dangerous. That is very dangerous because as we can see, things can shift and red carpets can be rolled out again as what we have not, would not, never imagined in the context of Syria. So in a, in a way, I don't think there is, no, I think there's a lot of hope. And and this is from someone who was there when chemical attacks took place in Syria and was under barrel bombs and, and was in cave and was working with, with a lot of victims. I still think, maybe I'm crazy, but I still think there is hope. Because I've seen already things turning, in a way. It just depends on how we define successes. And then the political will point, another wrong assumption to make is that politics don't change. So there's no political will. There might be no political will today, but there might be political will tomorrow. 
Politics change. That's, I think that's why they're called politics. Th 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 there is always new political realities. And in democracies, the political realities are largely informed by the population or largely involved by public interest to push on accountability. And that is where at the Reckoning Project we believe in kind of the local testimonies and making publications on local journalism and we're going to focus on global south countries. We have a full project now on global south countries in order to trigger the political interest for the politician on the top say I might not care where Ukraine is but I have an election coming. And, I, and, and this seems to be an issue that some of my crazy population care about and therefore it's in, within my pol political interest to look into th to this. Political interest is created. And the people that create it are here in this room. So the political dial can shift. The journalists, the lawyers, the governments, the people within the civil service are the ones that decide whether there is political interest in something or there isn't. So in a, in a way that is all part of the, 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 the process of not giving up in creating the political interest for accountability, because I know what would, hap what would happen if we don't do anything. And if we do lose hope, and I believe that there is nothing that can change. And I think Putin knows as well what will happen. Thank you. Alina, one final question goes to you. Um, Alina from the Finnish government. We're one of our kind donors. Thank you. Thank you, Janine, and thanks for the excellent panel discussion. I, I actually wanted to make one comment about genocide and about the language that we use when we're talking about accountability and international criminal justice. Um, but now also with the last question from online, I, I, I cannot help myself, but I need to kind of jump in on that and, and kind of refer to something that uh, Natalia was saying earlier, that why we're focusing so much on Ukraine is um, the, I would say, unforeseen access compared to many other situations um, where international crimes take place. Um, I don't think that Ukraine is one of those situations where we we are really seeing that kind of impunity or the lack of total lack of accountability I think there's it's quite the opposite there is an unprecedented amount of accountability efforts uh, nationally internationally civil society etc so it's m mainly the kind of the access to, to those who have been accused of, of perpetrating these crimes. Um, but coming back to genocide, and I have to say, first, I, I forgot to introduce myself, but I'm, I'm from the Finnish Foreign Ministry, so I'm an I'm a international lawyer slash diplomat, and I, I just wanted to add a word of caution about the, the language that we use. I mean, um, I, I'm, we're not against evolution of international criminal justice. We've been very <laughs> integrally part of it in, in many occasions as Finland. But I would just caution against using language um, sort of in a very careless manner. Because, I mean, when there is evidence, I mean, genocide, uh, genocide has been notoriously difficult to prove in, in courts of law. That's why, I mean, the, arguably you can see that prosecutors prefer to choose one of the other crimes to, to go after. When there is evidence, when there is considerable amount of evidence that points to genocide, obviously we should pursue accountability for genocide. But what we see in this kind of, in this international criminal law speech currently is that terms are being used very carelessly, that you would have people crying genocide with very little evidence. And usually in those cases, it's absolutely counterproductive. What we've seen also in some other situations is that we try to redefine kind of international criminal law and come up with these new definitions such as gender apartheid. And then you end up asking like, why is gender persecution, which is in the Rome Statute, why is, it, why is that not enough to kind of characterize the situation? Um, why I'm making this point is that if we come up with these new, very innovative terms, we sort of, in a way, also diminish 
the value of the tools that we already have. And I, I believe that we have the tools, we have the norms, we have the law, we just need to implement those. Thanks. Can Thank I, you so can much. I two, yeah. Can I add a two things? Yes, but the reason that we're having this debate around cultural genocide, which I don't like as a term, yeah, yeah, is for a specific reason. Yeah. Lemkin, there's people here from the Lemkin Center, wanted that in the genocide statutes. And it was stricken out. It was stricken out, you know, by which country? All of them. Every country got rid of it because they've all done a little bit of it, including, I'm sorry, Sweden, which maybe as a Finn you'd appreciate. Um, <laughs> it wasn't actually Swedish Finland then, because the Swedes had done some cultural genocide of some northern tribes, I think. But even Sweden got rid of that. And Lemkin spent his last years wandering around Central Park, unhappy, talking about this to strangers, how his idea had been crushed by the collective colonial interests of many, many, many powers, though, of course, the most vociferous opponents were the Soviets. So that's an injustice that happened. So we're not doing something new by exploring this theme. We're, we're trying to right a wrong. So again, I completely agree with you. These terms can become overused and become useless, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't struggle to find a legal language for what I call evil, but I think needs a legal language as well. I, th I think evil is an absolutely illegal language, so I'd absolutely agree with that. Um, the, the, I, I fully take your word of caution, and I, and I think I've seen, again, Siri has been brought up a million times on this panel, so I'll just bring it up again. I've seen what raising expectation looks like and not delivering. And these words and these terms come with expectations when, when, when people read them. You think when you use the word red line, people are going to react or there is a genocide, or whatever it is. P people feel like the international community might come now, and might do something, and might save me, and might be get getting out, and that's not necessarily the case. So f fully agree on, 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 on the idea of making sure to manage expectations. And that is why, again, part of the, 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 the Reckoning Project's actual operations, which is also on paper, and I know you've, you know it because you've seen the papers, is the, the articles before they get published, they get run by me. And I wouldn't stop using a word that might not be in necessarily in law, but we would make sure together that the way it's described doesn't explain it as what the law is today and therefore there's a consequence on it, but may able to be part of the debate on the issue because creating the momentum around it might be creating the political interest in order for, for law kind of to, to develop or not develop in, a situ in, in, in that case. But absolutely agree that managing expectations of the people that we're talking about is absolutely at the heart of this. And we need to be careful in a way not to raise the expectations in a way or toss around terms that then either give perpetrators an easy way out and say, no, according to the elements of crime 23.1c, that doesn't hold, and therefore they look like they know the law and, and therefore they're successful and things get crushed and victims will come to the lawyers and why didn't you tell me about 32.1c? Whatever 32.1c is, I'm not, don't look it up, I don't know what that is. But the point is, is that we need to be careful about what we're saying for those legal purposes. But that doesn't stop us from developing with the right disclaimers, with the right uh, uh, contextualization, issues that are, facts that are happening on the ground that do, that do not necessarily have the right qualification as the law currently stands. I think we could debate this all night, but we're, we're at an end here. So thank you to the panelists. I think our, uh, I think Sevgil is gone, Dr. Vanchak is gone, Peter, Ibrahim, Natalia. Thank you so much.